today, as you may have referenced, is the anniversary, the 32nd anniversary of one of the worst earthquakes to ever hit Mexico. It was in Mexico City. That earthquake was 8.0 on the Richter scale, but it killed upwards of 5,000. Some estimates say as many as 20,000 people. This one, as you said, about 73 miles south of Mexico City proper, but it was about 34 miles deep, a very deep earthquake, meaning the effects are felt much further away. Buildings all over Mexico City are in ruins this morning after a 7.1 magnitude earthquake. The violent shaking yesterday created widespread destruction. At least 217 people have been confirmed dead so far. Rescuers dug through collapsed buildings all night, pulling out survivors. The quake was centered about 70 miles southeast of Mexico City in the state of Puebla. This is the second deadly earthquake to hit Mexico this month. An 8.1 quake killed at least 90 people in southern Mexico two weeks ago. Manuel Bajorquez is in Mexico City with the desperate search for those missing. Manuel, good morning. Good morning. Right now, every second is critical in neighborhoods like this one. I want you to take a look behind me. That is what's left of a six-story office building that collapsed. We are told that 20 people have been rescued, but up to 40 people may still be trapped inside. Search and rescue operations like this one are happening throughout the Mexican capital this morning. As soon as the earthquake hit, parts of central Mexico were devastated. Building after building crumbled to the ground, leaving massive piles of splintered wood and broken concrete. At least 25 students and teachers were killed when an elementary school collapsed in Mexico City. All but four of them were children. Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto visited the wreckage last night, where rescuers were digging for the missing. It was really violent. I've never experienced anything like that. U.S. citizen Brittany Kaiser was giving a presentation in Mexico City when it struck. She and thousands of people fled to the streets as the air filled with smoke from collapsed buildings. When we came outside, you could see everything moving from the street lamps and the trees and like anything, even like the cars that were on the street. There were some buildings that are completely and utterly demolished. Rescue teams and volunteers searched through the rubble for victims. They found several people trapped and lifted them to safety on stretchers. There was one hard jolt and then the ground began to roll. The deadly earthquake happened exactly 32 years after the 1985 Mexico quake that killed thousands. Orlando Silver was in Mexico City for both. I mean, the city is in complete chaos and it just looked like the city had been just bombarded. It, it, looked, it was pretty devastating. Unfortunately, it continues to be quite strong. In fact, it's even grown in strength in the last couple of hours. Sustained winds 165, and now the National Hurricane Center does believe it will make landfall in Puerto Rico, most likely just before that, with these winds at 165. That would make this the strongest hurricane in history to make landfall. The winds are ferocious right now, gusting above 120 miles per hour, severing the tops of the palm trees and ripping off the boarding that's on buildings. There's a high rise about 100 yards behind me, and it's continually tearing pieces of the building away, and they're flying through the air like projectiles. We are in front of a hotel right now, the safest place we've found, and inside everyone's been evacuated to the bottom floor, but in the lobby, pieces of the ceiling started to fall, so they took them into an emergency stairwell. Even the police are here with us. It's too dangerous for them to be out right now. This is the best, safest spot for them. Hurricane Maria barreled through St. Croix overnight before roaring ashore in Puerto Rico. This video was taken just outside of our hotel room showing the force of Maria's violent winds. It was enough for the hotel to order guests down to the lobby level. The region was still rebounding from the last storm, Irma, when Maria rolled in. We've never had any back-to-back -back hurricanes before. Yolanda Maldonado has been without power since Hurricane Irma two weeks ago. Now she's in a shelter in San Juan. I've passed through hurricanes, but this one, it's gonna be very hard. Here's an update to the situation going on at the hotel where we are in San Juan. The managers have told our crew that there's nowhere else to bring the guests other than that emergency stairwell. That is the last resort for them. The winds 
on the streets of San Juan right now are making it impossible to even see down the street. It's literally a wind tunnel. And we're told, Charlie, that this is going to continue for probably the next six hours. River, they're not only dealing with flooded homes, but also dead fish popping up downstream. ABC Action News reporter Wendy Lane looks into what all of the dead fish could mean. As if the flood water wasn't bad enough, people who live north of where the flooding is happening on the Whitlacoochee River say they're dealing with a completely different problem. The water's bad. You smell it. It stinks. Everybody live here has to smell it. It stinks. Robin Cyrus has lived next to the Whitlacoochee River for more than 50 years. There's not enough oxygen in the water and there's too much pollution in the river. That's why he says the dead fish are popping up along the riverbanks in Citrus County, which is downstream from where the major flooding is happening. A lot of fish are dying for sure. I mean, I don't even want to take my boat out there. <laughs> Florida Fish and Wildlife are investigating the cause of the dead fish and say a lack of oxygen in the water from all the flooding could be a factor. They're also investigating a stinky film that's flowing along the banks. Yeah, it smells pretty bad. Cyrus believes the smell is coming from methane gas. A lot of excess runoff, sewage from people's tank, septic tanks that are being flooded. The flood water is still threatening nearly 2,000 homes along the Withlacoochee River and is expected to crest on Wednesday at 17 and a half feet. Cyrus says he thinks the bad water will get flushed out when the flood water recedes, but for now, he says it should be taken seriously. New tonight, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission is investigating a dramatic fish kill on the Treasure Coast. And the dead fish are not the only concern neighbors must deal with. News Channel 5's Alyssa Hyman live in Port St. Lucie to explain. Alyssa. Well, Michael, the biggest and most immediate issue for folks right now is that it smells and it smells badly. You can see just the hundreds of fish right here caught in the buoys and the vegetation over here. You're looking at the C24 Canal. We are just east of Port St. Lucie Boulevard over here to my left. Those are the flood control gates and ultimately this leads out to the North Fork of the St. Lucie River. But right now, most people just want to know what caused this and who's going to be responsible for cleaning it up. It's hard to live here now. Port St. Lucie's Miguel Gonzalez can't stomach the stench anymore. Sometimes it smells inside a house. He now walks around his neighborhood with Vicks Vapor Rub and a towel. I take my little dog outside and it's hard to be outside. For at least six days now, he's been dealing with a deadly odor. That fishy smell, hundreds of dead fish just sitting in the C-24 canal, which sits right in front of his Dalton Circle home. Somebody's gotta come in. It's a bad smell, worse in the morning when the sun comes up. The suffocating smell now seeping into the entire neighborhood. Ever since it's been like that, we haven't seen anybody come around. At this point, FWC would only say it's looking into the fish kill, but something like this can happen after a major storm like Irma, when there's a sudden runoff. What you're seeing is a fish kill usually caused by a deprivation of oxygen in the water. Mark Perry with the Florida Oceanographic Society told me, well, it can happen after a storm. It doesn't happen after every storm, so it's important to get to the bottom of it. We have to be careful not to assess too quickly because it could be a chemical situation. It could be some pesticide or something in the water which caused you know, the fish to um, to die like that in mass numbers like that. That's, that's very big fish kill. Back out here live, Perry says it's also important to get these very important answers because right now this water is flowing into the St. Lucie River. But just on a side note, this canal, the C-24 canal, does not get any water from Lake Okeechobee.
Havana's iconic waterfront promenade, submerged. This was last week, just hours after Hurricane Irma left Cuba's waters on its way to Florida. When the storm waters did recede, it took much with it, including most of Mary Salcedo's belongings. Even her bathroom sink and her front door were not spared. For the last four decades, she's lived along Havana's coastal road. It has a view, but it's also exposed to the extremes of weather. My children grew up here, so did my grandchildren. The sea had come in before, but it hadn't affected us like this. It would come in and leave, but this time it was too strong, it was too much. About 60 percent of Cubans live near the country's coastline. Authorities fear hurricanes like Irma will become more frequent and leave lasting damage. Statistics show that around 27 coastal communities here in Cuba will disappear by 2050. Over the next 30 to 40 years, those communities are looking at an over 20 centimeter rise in sea level. They will be flooded. The Cuban government has made dealing with the impact of climate change a national priority. It set ambitious goals for renewable energy and banned new constructions along coastal areas. But Cuba's biggest challenge when it comes to dealing with the impact of climate change may have less to do with new constructions and more with existing ones. Throughout the country, but especially here in Old Havana, crumbling buildings make it much more dangerous for residents to face stronger, more persistent storms. First it was San Diego. Now health officials say there's an outbreak of hepatitis A here in L.A. County. KCAL 9's Joy Benedict is live in downtown L.A. with important information for us. Joy? That's right, Lena. There are 10 confirmed cases of hepatitis A right here in L.A. County, enough for the county officials to declare an outbreak here in our area. Now, all 10 cases are affecting people who are associated with the homeless, and as you can see right across the street, they live in very close proximity, and that's why health officials want to make sure we all take precautions. As dozens of homeless men and women filed into the L.A. mission for lunch... Others went to work, scrubbing and spraying the common areas and the sidewalks outside. With thousands living in close proximity on Skid Row, hygiene is always an issue. But with an official outbreak of hepatitis A, it's now a necessity. Blessed to be able to come here and shower and clean up and sleep. Melvin so Humphreys is homeless. He's heard of Hep A and knows how to prevent it. Hygiene kits, it's all, all this stuff is free. You just have to come get it. The Los Angeles County Department of Public Health declared an outbreak today at the county supervisor's meeting. You can get free vaccine at all of our clinics. Hepatitis A is a virus that affects the liver. It's transmitted by not washing your hands after going to the bathroom, through food, sex, and sharing needles or cigarettes. With more than 400 cases in San Diego County, officials here want to stop the virus from spreading. In San Diego, 4% of the people who were identified as being infected actually died. There is no treatment for Hep A, which makes those with existing health issues most vulnerable. This is, in fact, a disease that's preventable. Through hygiene and vaccination, which is why the county hopes to vaccinate 40,000 homeless people, including Humphreys, who says he's willing to do what he needs to to stay safe. Don't want to get sick. By the grace of God, I won't get sick. And for those of you who think, oh, I'm not around the homeless, this doesn't affect me, think again. The hepatitis A virus doesn't need a host. What that means is it can live on hard, cold surfaces for weeks, even up to two months. All you have to do is come by all those weeks later, touch a place that is carrying that virus, and then you yourself can become affected. Online jihadist propaganda gets more clicks in the UK than anywhere else in Europe, according to a new report, which also warns of inadequately governed internet platforms. The findings from the policy exchange suggest that ISIL produces over 100 items of content a week, including bomb-making guides and execution videos. These are distributed on encrypted messaging apps, social media sites and file-sharing pages. Almost three-quarters of people surveyed supported 
the introduction of tougher laws to make it a criminal offence to regularly engage with material that glorifies terrorism. The foreword to the report was written by former US military commander and director of the CIA, General David Petraeus. He called the fight against online terrorism insufficient, but acknowledged the difficulty in striking a balance between privacy and protection. The United States has great strength and patience, but if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission for himself and for his regime. The United States is ready, willing and able, but hopefully this will not be necessary. It was a verbal missile. Rocket Man is on a suicide mission that exploded on social media. Reaction ranged from infantile to awesome, tweeted one critic. Till other countries respect this nation again, tweeted another. I would bet you Kim Jong Un likes being called Rocket Man. Posted someone else, leave Elton John alone. What's your favorite kind of music? What music do you like? Well, I think Elton John is great. No word on whether Elton John thinks it's great. That the president is using his song. Google says searches for Rocket Man have skyrocketed. It was The Economist magazine that first dubbed Kim Jong Un's father Rocket Man back in 2006. The president first tweeted the insult Sunday. He named Kim Jong Un after an Elton John song, Rocket Man. <laughs> I would have gone with Tiny Dancer, but you know, he's, I'm not the president. One fan tweeted of President Trump, he's a master troll and brander. For those who say President Trump is trolling North Korea's leader, look, a President Trump troll doll actually exists. The President of the United States is trolling, and Elton Jong Un is live in concert. Genie Mode, CNN, New York.